got this new cross here when I had to share a room today. All right, here we go. P1. Let's talk about the sets of numbers. We have the natural and the whole and the integers. Anybody know what any of these are? All right, tell me one more. Okay, now, oh, no. okay, now stop, 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 that's not bad, um, that's not bad, but it, it's not complete, because, for example, negative 8 is not a fraction, well, I guess it could be negative 8 or 1, but negative 8 is not a whole number. So it's positive? So whole numbers, the set of whole numbers is the set 0, 1, 2, 3. There's really no way to define whole numbers other than in a roster. This is called a roster, and you just list them. Now, the natural numbers are the same thing, except 0 isn't included. So I always remember that, as silly as it might sound, 0 has a hole in it. So the natural numbers, or you can think of it especially for Baby Scarlet, when Baby Scarlet learns to start counting, which will be soon if Grandma has anything to do with it. Um, <laughs> You start with one, two, three. That's how you naturally count. And then you throw in the concept of nothing. So you throw in zero. Now the integers, do you know what that, that is? That's when you throw in what? What comes next? Negatives. Negatives, yeah. In our development as counters, we've got the negatives thrown in there. So the integers are just the same as the whole numbers, except they also include all of the negatives. Now, what about rational and irrational? What's that? Anybody have an idea? Okay, well, rational numbers, um, we defined it as the A's over B's such that A and B are integers and B is not zero. So that is just a fancy way of saying any number that can be written as a fraction. But this is the definition that honor students should be familiar with. So A over B such that A and B are integers. So A and B come from this set, but B cannot be zero because we all know you can't divide by zero. Now, what are irrational numbers then? And even if you don't know the definition, give me some examples. Yeah, like the cubic decimal. Actually, let's go come back up to rational for a minute. Would two thirds, uh, according to this definition, would two thirds be a rational number? Yeah. Yes. What is two thirds as a decimal? Uh, point. Or six repeating. So repeating decimals are included in this. If you are a repeating decimal, you're in this, okay? You're included in there. So then it would be like, like four root three. Exactly. So irrational numbers are non-terminating, non-repeating decimals. So they are decimals that don't repeat and they don't terminate. If you took out your calculator and you typed in four root three, you will see a whole bunch of decimal places, but that thing, it, I mean, the calculator screen only has however many places. If you had a bigger calculator screen, it would just keep going, 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 never terminating or repeat, or never repeating. So irrational is gonna include things like um, radicals, Right? That was your example. What else? Pi. Pi. The most famous irrational number probably is pi. Yep. The most famous one. Okay. All right. Those are a couple of examples. Now, the real numbers are the numbers that if you were to put all of the rationals and all of the ra irrationals in a big pot, you would have the real numbers. 
So the real numbers are the union of the rational and irrational numbers. In other words, all decimals. If rational is repeating or terminating, and irrational is non-repeating, non-terminating, then this would cover all the bases when you put them together, all the decimals. Now, how about this imaginary stuff? Okay, so the letter we use to denote the imaginary unit is I. What does I stand for again? Square root of negative one. Exactly. So I is the square root of negative one. And if a number is any multiple of I, it is called pure imaginary. So a pure imaginary number, I'm going to put it underneath so I can pick it up on the video. A pure imaginary number is something of the form um, bi, where b is real and i is the square root of negative one. So bi, so 2i, root 6i. And when I say root 6i, I probably should say i root 6. I don't want the i under the radical. Although we don't do that this year. Um, take the square roots of imaginary numbers. So a pure imaginary number is something like 10i. A complex number is a plus bi, where a and b are real, and i is the imaginary unit. So a complex number is something like 4 plus 6i. You remember getting answers like that last year when you did the quadratic formula and the, you get like four plus or minus six i? Yeah, those are called complex numbers. So complex numbers have two components. A by itself is a real number. Bi is a pure imaginary. When you put those together by adding or subtracting them, you're going to get a what we call a complex number. All the numbers that we're ever going to talk about in this class will be some version of a complex number. They either have an I or they don't. All right, so let's see how much we picked up on that. Number two, to which number sets do the following belong? So we're going to list them all. Negative seven. Negative seven is an integer. What else? It's rational. Because negative seven is negative seven over one, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yep, so that's rational. What else is it then? Real. real, definitely a real number. And it is a complex. complex number. Because negative seven, couldn't you think of negative seven like this? Yep, so it is complex. What about root 32? Definitely irrational because any radical that doesn't simplify or completely disappear is going to end up being irrational. So root 32 is irrational. What else is it? Real. Real. And then, of course, it is complex. How about six? Um, natural whole integer. Natural whole integer. Rational. rational and then real. real. Complex. Hmm, tricky. Square root of negative four. Imaginary, pure imaginary. Pure imaginary and complex. Because the square root of negative four, we learned last year, is two, two i. I. Mm -hmm. Two i. So it's of this form, bi. Negative two thirds. Negative two thirds is rational, all oh, rational, and definitely real, and definitely complex. All right, everybody good there? 
All right, now we got our properties. See, again, I told you, this is all stuff you've studied before. We're just reviewing it. So can somebody tell me? Um, and I'm not writing them separately. There are two commutative properties, one for addition and one for subtract, or one for addition and one for multiplication. Um, but I'm not going to list them separately. What does a commutative property do? Um, no matter how you write it, you'll end up with the same ratio. What do you mean by that? So, like the example, like the example, four plus three is the same as three plus four. Bingo. So basically, no matter what order you write it, the answer is going to be the same. So the commutative property and and my pet peeve, one of my pet peeves, and we discover I have many, unfortunately, but one of my pet peeves is there's no N in the word. So it's not commutative, it's commutative, okay? So the commutative property says A plus B equals B plus A, or AB equals BA, depending on if we are adding or multiplying. What's how about associative? It's that thing where it looks like no matter how you read those groups. Mm -hmm. well, that's the key word, that's a grouping thing. So A plus B plus C is the same as A plus B plus C. It's a grouping thing. So commutative deals with order and associative deals with grouping. Remember, I mean, if you look at this problem here, you look at this associative thing, aren't the letters in the same order? So it's not commutative. If they're in the same order, it's not commutative. The parentheses are grouping differently. And the same is true of multiplication. Same idea. All right, what about identity? It does if you're adding. A plus zero is A, or A times one is A. So what it means to be an identity is do it and you get the identical result. So if you add zero, you get the identical thing back again. If you times by one, you get the identical thing back again. Okay, um, inverse, what's that one? symmetric property. That's one of the properties of equality. Um, so we'll talk about that one later. But yeah, that is a, definitely a property. The inverse is, the, okay, this is the property that you do something and you get the same thing back again. This property undoes everything. So it, an example, a plus the opposite of a is zero. So this is a canceling property inverse property is a canceling property. So A times one over A is one. So if you add a number and add it to the inverse, this guy right here has two names. He's called the additive inverse, but he is also called the opposite. So when somebody says the opposite, they're talking about the additive inverse. Similarly, this is called the multiplicative inverse. That's a mouthful. But it's also called the reciprocal. The reciprocal is simply the multiplicative inverse. Okay, so somehow in your mind, you gotta be able to keep these two straight. Sometimes kids mix them up. Actually, they mix these up too, so you gotta keep it all straight. All right, then we got our friend, the distributive property. And then we have the trichotomy. Okay, so what's the distributive property look like? When you deal with um, A times B plus C, then that's the same thing as AB plus AC. Perfect, that's the distributive property. Now, what I want you to understand though is kids, this is a property which means it's both ways. So if I started with something like CB plus CF, 
I could factor out that C, would you agree with me? Mm -hmm. That's the distributive property. Every time you factor, you're doing distributive. It's backwards of how you normally see it, but it's the distributive property. And then you may not have heard of these trichotomies. What do you think it involves? Look at the word tri. So it means three things exactly. So the trichotomy says and this is really obvious, but it's you know, sometimes mathematicians like to be over thorough with things. Given two real numbers, A and B, either A equals B, or what? A is less than B, or A is greater than B. This is the property that allows us to put things on the number line, because it says any two numbers are going to have one of those three relationships. On the number line, they're either going to be the same dot, A is going to be the left of B, or A is going to be the B right of B. You're thinking, oh my gosh, that's so dumb. Well, hey, here it is. This is what it is. This is what we know. All right, let's see how much you learn. Let's look at the properties. Here we go. What's A? Additive. Additive identity. Let's stipulate operation. So you can either say additive with a plus sign, or additive identity, or you, excuse me, you can say identity with a plus sign, or you can say additive identity. All right, what about B? Oh, that's my trick question. That's commutative of addition. So you can write like commutative with a plus sign if you want. But why is it commutative? Look at the letters and numbers. Because the order. The order's different. Guys, the same two things are in parentheses, right? But the order is different. C is associative of multiplication. So when we abbreviate that one, let's be careful. Let's go ahead and put an OC on the end and then you can just put a time sign. Or you can write associative of multiplication. My first year teaching, or maybe it was my second, I can't remember, right at the very beginning of my career, the, um, we were, I was teaching geometry. And you remember when you did um, congruent triangles and you had angle side angle and yeah, side, side 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 and all those things. Okay, well then there's one you can't have, right? right? So me being like new and not really thinking about it, I'm making a big deal about the fact that you've gone through, you've done all these problems. And I said, okay, now we can use all these different combinations, but you can't use this one because it makes a bad word, so you'll remember it. So I have ASS written in giant letters on my board and in comes the vice principal, oh. who happens to be a nun on top of everything else. Yeah, so we didn't explain that to her. All right, D, what's going on in D? Additive inverse. So inverse with a plus sign or additive inverse. What about E? Multiplicative inverse. Multiplicative inverse. So again, any abbreviation you use is fine as long as I can tell you the multiplicative inverse. All right, what about F? Um, Commutative. Commutative. Don't we have the same thing in the parentheses? Aren't the things grouped the same way? We just got them in a different order. So that's commutative multiplication. How about G? Yeah, it's distributive. Anytime you factor, it's distributive. How about H? It's the multiplicative identity. How about I? Oh, so since one fifth times five that cancels, would that be the um, inverse? The multiplicative inverse.
Okay, now we're going to change some fractions into decimals. And decimals into fractions. Okay, now, how do you change a fraction into a decimal? Exactly, it's a division problem. So that is easy. I don't anticipate any issues with that. So three fifths. Well, now here's the problem. Right off the bat, we have a bigger numerator, I mean, a bigger denominator than numerator. So you guys know, you just add the zero. So 0.6. Did you know that already? I mean, three fifths is a pretty common fraction. You don't have to show any work. I mean, but if you don't know how to do it, you can divide. All right, what about the other way around? What about five thirds? Well, we've got to add the zeros again. What's going to happen here? We've got to put, put it out yet? So we're going to write that as 1.6 repeating. Remember the little bar over the top? Negative 8 ninths. The fact it's negative doesn't change a thing. We're still going to have to divide 9 into 8, right? is actually three tenths only if it's repeating is it one third there's no repeating over that could we make this 13 tenths yeah one decimal place is tenths right now if you wanted to do what we were talking about sir you could do one plus three tenths but then you got to mess around and figure out what one plus three tenths is so aren't we going to end up with 13 tenths and that's 10 tenths so it's probably just easier to take that decimal and put it over 10. Now, what about the repeating 0.4? Now, without the repeating, that would be 4 tenths and 4 2 fifths, right? Everybody knows that. But what do we do when it's repeating? Anybody know? Well, there's a little trick, and we kind of have already observed it. What happened here? This was eight nines, right? Mm -hmm. And that turned out to be repeating eights. Mm -hmm. oh. So when it's not repeating, you put it over ten. ten. Yeah. But when a single you digit repeats, itself. you put it over nine. Oh, nine. You put it over nine. Now, there that's a little trick that always, always, always happens. But let me kind of show you why that is. Okay, there's a couple different ways we can do that. Let me let, let's take our number 0.444, and let's say that's x. I'm just gonna call that x, okay? Now I'm gonna times it by 10. So 10x would be 4.444444. Would you agree with that? Now, if I subtract these two, what's 10x minus 1x? 9x. And what happens when I subtract here? Doesn't all that disappear? So all I have left is four. So x equals four nine. So that's kind of one of the math procedures. Later on in the year, we'll learn another procedure to do it, but this way it's, it's number two. So if one decimal place repeats, it's over nine, always. So if we had 0.1 repeating, that would be one ninth. 0.2 repeating is two ninths, and so on and so on and so on. If they're not repeating, you put them over 10, right? Okay, let's do one more. Root three over two. That one is what kind of a number? Irrational, which means what about it as a decimal? It won't. It's not going to repeat and it's not going to terminate. 
So are you actually going to be able to change that into a decimal? You know, you might be able to get some approximation, you know, but you can start right now and keep working on it until you're below the mean and you'll never get it because it's just going to keep on going forever and ever. All right, the last one, point two four. Point two four. So that would be 24 over 99, which of course reduces to, let's see, what goes in the front of this? Three goes in, eight, Who's got a calculator? Divide eight by 33, eight divided by 33, and make sure we get repeated in point two four. Have a good day. Thank you. You want to start your homework and get part of it done? That's fine.